All God's blessings, everyone. I'm the Reverend Dr. Chris McMullen, and this is our online video service for the parish of the Upper Kennebecasis in beautiful Kings County, New Brunswick, for the second Sunday in the Epiphany season, January 17th, 2021. And it's a service of the word taken from the book of Alternative Services. You can find a bulletin for this uh, from my Scrib site, it's, it's, uh, the link is provided underneath the YouTube video. May God bless us as we worship him together. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall so forth your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that you have again brought us together in this internet way to praise you for your goodness and to ask for your blessing. Give us grace to see your hand in the week that is past and your purpose in the week to come, through Christ our Lord. Amen. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and the shepherds have found their way home, the work of Christmas is begun. I am the light of the world. You people come and follow me. If you follow and love, you'll learn the mystery of what you were meant to do and be. To find the lost and lonely one. To heal the broken soul with love. To feed the hungry children with warmth and good food. To feel the earth below, the sky above. I am the light of the world. You people come and follow me. If you follow and love, you'll learn the mystery of what you were meant to do and be. To free the prisoner from all chains, to make the powerful care, to rebuild the nations with strength and goodwill, to see God's children everywhere. I am the light of the world. You people come and follow me. If you follow and love, you'll learn the mystery of what you were meant to do and be. To bring hope to every task you do. To dance at a baby's new birth. To make music in an old person's heart. To sing to the colors of the earth. I am the light of the world. You people come and follow me. If you follow and love, you'll learn the mystery of what you were meant to do and be. Thank you for that invitation, Lord Jesus. You, the light of the world, may we follow you in works that anticipate all the blessings of glory even now in love and healing and justice. Our colic for today from the Book of Alternative Services for the second Sunday after the Epiphany. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, shine with the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Even he who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
the uh, theme of the first couple Sunday services after the Sunday celebrating the baptism of Jesus, Sunday after the Epiphany, in the revised common lectionary used by Christians around the world and across the centuries. Um, the theme of these Sundays are really on the call to discipleship, uh, saying yes to God's yes to us. And so the Old Testament scripture for this Sunday in year B is the calling of Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 to 10. In the almost previous book in the Bible, the book of Judges, Israel has degenerated into civil war and de depravity under the leadership of judges who really don't deserve the title, who really have spurned the guidance of the Spirit in them in their own selfish ends. Uh, the author of the book of Judges longs for there to be a king to give Israel unity. Now, the kings were a disappointment too, of course, leading to the longing for a Messiah. And that's where the Christian story comes in. After the book of Judges, you have Ruth, oh, the book of Ruth. And in Ruth, you have this, this wonderful family, some of whom aren't even Jewish, trusting in God in a deep way, and they become the forebears of the great King David. So in spite of the depravity and the discouragement of the times in Israel, God is at work in the love and the loyalty and the goodness of ordinary Jewish believers. And that will eventually lead to David. Then we have 1 Samuel. And we hear this woman who offers her first child to Samuel. She's unable to have children. She's a disgrace in the community. She prays about this. Um, so desperately that she gets in trouble with the, the priest in the tabernacle. But her prayer is answered and she gives birth to Samuel and she dedicates Samuel to the Lord. He becomes what I used to call my altar servers in church. My young people helped me at the Holy Communion, the altar. She, Samuel becomes the first altar server, helping the old fellow Eli in the uh, temple. And Samuel is called, and Samuel becomes a great prophet, who is the one who eventually anoints and guides David as king of Israel. And he unites Israel uh, around their faith in the Lord, and their loyalty to the covenant. And this is the beginning of his calling, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So Samuel went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel. He got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to the boy. The Lord called Samuel a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Go lie down. 
and if the Lord calls you again, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the psalm to celebrate and echo and pray that lesson is in the Revised Common Lectionary is Psalm 139. I'll read the version from the Book of Alternative Services. I'm going to pray verses 1 to 5 and 12 to 17. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word in my lips, but you, O Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret Woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there was none of them. How deep I find your thoughts, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Psalm Prayer in the Book of Alternative Services God of mystery and power, even our minds and hearts are the veils and signs of your presence. We come in silent wonder to learn the way of simplicity, the eternal road that leads to love for you and for your whole creation. We come as your son Jesus Christ taught us and in his name. Amen. Our gospel lesson from the first chapter of St. John, verses 43 to 51. Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael. The next day, after John the Baptist introduced Jesus to John and Andrew, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked Jesus, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, 
I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe? Because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than these. And he said to Nathanael, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Oh, for sinners slain. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I shall see his face, and there I'll serve my king forever in that holy place. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till your work on earth is done. Father, speak your word to us that we may hear you and be thrilled. Jesus, be God's word with us that we may know your presence and be loyal. Spirit, be God's word within us that we may be children of God, sisters and brothers of Jesus, and followers of the word. Amen. As I mentioned, the season of Epiphany uh, begins with the baptism of Jesus, which we uh, read about and thought about last week. And those of us who watched this video or others perhaps renewed your baptismal promises. And then epiphany means manifestation or showing. And between now and Lent, we have readings on God revealing his glory and his love to his people, especially the followers of Jesus, through Jesus, and calling us to discipleship to um, honor and share in this glory that God shares with us, manifests in us, Epiphany. And one of the readings that we'll hear this year, we'll hear it next week, is Jesus calling the fishermen, and Mark reports this, we'll hear this next week very dramatically. Peter and Andrew and James and John, the boys are, are clear cleaning her nets after fishing, and Jesus comes along and says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, and they drop their nets and follow Jesus. Mark wants to emphasize the urgency and the opportunity of becoming followers of Jesus. And some traditions emphasize that, you know, you need to be converted. You need to um, 
get right with Jesus and follow him. And that's an important emphasis. We shouldn't lose it in a tradition where we're baptized as children and have grown up gradually in the faith, uh, like Samuel, for instance. But John, and I mentioned before, that John seems to write his gospel with a little bit of a glimmer in his eye. John writes his gospel almost assuming we know the story of Jesus we can find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are also similar in a way. And, and kind of adds other um, stories or other information or puts his emphasis elsewhere just to kind of expand our appreciation of Jesus and of ourselves as his followers. And so in John chapter 1, he talks about how it was John the Baptist who kind of pointed Jesus out to some of Jesus' first followers. And they spent some time with him and got to know him before that dramatic calling when they dropped their nets by the seashore. And there's a lesson to be learned here. Discipleship is urgent. And this is a wonderful once in a lifetime opportunity, once in a lifetime opportunity to follow Jesus. But it may be for many of us a gradual discovery and realization and a lifelong journey as we get to know Jesus. I want to focus on Nathaniel and his discovery that even when he was under the fig tree, Jesus knew him before he had even met Jesus. And how that made, that discovery made Nathaniel a believer on the spot. He said, you are the anointed one, the Messiah. You are God's son. And Jesus, I think, finds that uh, something to kind of celebrate, you know, with a bit of humor. And says, you think if that's spectacular, wait till you see angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's a reference, of course, to the very beautiful story of Jacob's ladder. Jacob and all of his troubles and dangers falls asleep and using a rock for a pillow in the wilderness. And he wrestles all night. I'm oh, sorry, I got the story mixed up. He falls asleep and he's, he's afraid and he has a dream where he sees a ladder to heaven. Jacob's ladder and the angels ascending and descending on the ladder. You know, and uh, that there is commerce, there is traffic, there is communication back and forth from glory to his life with all of his troubles. And Jesus will be that ladder. Jesus will be the one in whom God will be made manifest, the epiphany, and he is calling others to follow him that we might be. As he signed the light of the world, he also said, you are the light of the world. You know, that your light shall shine before others. They will see the good works and the glory to your Father in heaven. So he's inviting Nathaniel to be one of these ones, one, uh, the fulfillment of the vision of Jacob's ladder, one through whom the angels of God, the messengers of God, uh, will be coming and going from uh, eternity to our troubled life here and now. And so sometimes this is a gradual thing, but the point is, is that Jesus always knows us. He sees us under our fig trees, under our fig trees. Now, what did Jesus mean by saying to Nathaniel? Uh, Nathaniel says, Nathaniel and um, Philip are coming to Jesus. And Jesus looks at Nathaniel and says, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He's never even met the guy, but he discerns something in Nathaniel's spirit. You see, one of those sort of utterly realistic persons that... Um, uh, nonetheless, you know, what you see is what you get. He's always honest. He may not be a really always a good person. He may have a strength and his weaknesses, but he's honest about that. There's no guile in him, no deceit. And Jesus can work with that. We don't have to be perfect. You see, we don't have to be uh, shining moral examples. You know, Jesus came to, to seek and to save the lost. But we need to be willing to say, I'm sorry, we need to repent. We need to be honest about who we are. Believe it or not, we will encourage and inspire and invite others to have a deeper relationship with God, not by pretending we're super Christians and we know everything, but if we simply share the successes and the failures, 
the moments of glory and the moments of, of um, guilt in our daily walk with God, that'll be much more comfortable and helpful to people than anything. And so something like Nathaniel, you know, Jesus likes that. Here's an Israelite in which there's no deceit. I can use this guy. Nathaniel, of course, says, well, what do you know about me? I mean, he's, what ever, good ever came out of Nazareth? And Jesus says, I saw you under that fig tree before Philip called you. And that convinces Nathaniel, this is the guy. I'm going to spend my life with him. So what? John doesn't tell us, eh? What was going on with Nathaniel and the fig tree? Fig tree has great symbolism in the biblical story, in the Old Testament, and that may give us some help. First, the fig tree had beautiful big leaves, and they were famous for being able to provide shade to people and comfort. In fact, the leaves were used uh, in the marketplace. Like today, we might use plastic bags, although we're going to be ending that, thanks be to God. In the old days, things used to get wrapped in newspaper or, or butcher's paper, right? And everything else fell. In Jesus' day, most often, things would get wrapped in fig leaves. Was Nathaniel hiding under that fig tree? Maybe not literally, but maybe figuratively. He was under that fig tree feeling like unworthy, feeling he had failed, you know, feeling like he couldn't show his face. It's just a thought. But Jesus saw that. Jesus saw that and he said, good for you, Nathaniel, for being honest. I know life is hard. I know sin is strong. I have come to defeat it, to give you a spirit, the Holy Spirit. I know that, that sensitive conscience that is bothering you right now is from my Father because he loves you. That restlessness is because you are a better person than that. And you just need the courage the wisdom learning from your mistakes, the cussed loyalty to God to overcome that and be the kind of person you were called to be. God sees us under our fig trees. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? They had this communion with God. They were vitally present to God. And God was vitally present to them, closer to them than their own breath and the wind of the, of the garden where God was present and walked. Yet when they turned from God, they were ashamed of what did they do. They sewed fig leaves together to hide their nakedness. They could no longer stand before God. So now what's going on in Nathaniel's life? Just guessing from the biblical symbolism of the fig leaves. But God still loves them. God forgives them. And God still wants Nathaniel to be a follower of his son. Now, if we can have that experience, in the Anglican tradition, we call it the absolution. In a greater reform tradition, it's called the assurance of pardon. That assurance that our sins are forgiven and that our heart is wounded and Conscience, written as it is, is precious and loved by God. And that, that is not the last word about us. Maybe that's what reassured Nathaniel. Jesus saying, you're honest. You're an honest man. Here's his light who there is no guile. Thrilled to meet you. Who knows? Or, the fig tree in the Bible was very much a symbol of the 
overwhelming richness of life. The figs were very, very sweet fruit. You know, a fig tree could produce fruit in that climate where there was no winter like our Canadian winters, up to three times a year. Every time the fruit would be a little different. They would dry it. I'm sure we've all had dried fruit, maybe even dried figs. Maybe, you know, wonderful. And so this was a, a, a sign of, we get sugar so often for, for people who didn't have sugar in every product, you know. Uh, it was a sign of being surprised and thrilled with delight. I suppose the equivalent is when you and I have a chocolate. For me, anyway, the equivalent is if I have a chocolate. Wow, I'm diabetic. So I said, I'm not going to waste my sugar. If we're going to have sugar, you know, and I have to diet around it, you know, to make sure that that, that won't put my blood sugar levels too high. I want sugar with chocolate. That's my preference. Chocolate or um, fruitcake. Our Tabor it started a tradition now. This is the second year, so for Anglicans, that's a tradition. Barb, Barb Taylor gives me this wonderful homemade fruitcake every year. The sweetness of it, they sort of like figs, I suppose. Uh, what a delight, what a thrill. So I'm wondering, and, and, and references to the figs and fruit trees in the Old Testament are often this sort of thing. The kind of a and so was Nathaniel having a mystical experience under that fig tree? Was he sitting here under the shade of that great tree, looking at the beauty of the world around, and had a moment of mystery, a kind of a personal theophany, a sense of God is good? Was that what he was experiencing, a moment of worship? And I pray that we are often surprised and blessed and delighted by these moments, these mystical moments of worship. I remember one time a colleague of mine we were working in social work on the down south, east side of Skid Row, out of a church mission there. And she told me all about stepping out her front door that morning, greeting, and she lived right uh, downtown, stepping right outside. And she said, I had this most mystical, transcending experience that God was alive. And she thought she could tell me because I wouldn't think she was crazy, you know. I hope we have those moments. Now, there's disciplines we can have, Christian disciplines, knowing the story of the Bible, praying regularly, Holy Communion, uh, you know, on a weekly basis. There's many, many ways in which we can open our human spirits so that we can be aware of when God's Spirit is kind of moving in us, getting our attention, discovering the beauty of God and creation around us. But the point is that these, all, these moments always surprise us, and we know they're a gift. We haven't manufactured them. They come to us from beyond, and they're precious, and they're a part of the energy and the sweetness, the, the chocolates of the Christian life, the figs. Was Nathaniel having one of those moments? And Jesus is naming it, because the mystery of God's eternity, the overwhelming thrilling of the creator behind this whole creation all around us, the stars at night, you know, this great infinity beyond and everything has a human face that we can relate to in Jesus. In Jesus, we can see the personality, the purpose, the identity of this great mystery. It not, it's not just the laws of mechanics and chemistry. It's personal. He's love. Father, Son, and Spirit. And these moments, that love comes through to us. And when we're Philip, I'm sorry, Nathaniel meets Jesus, Philip's introduced him, you know, and he sees something in Jesus' um, regard for him. He sees something in Jesus' eyes, something in Jesus' smile. And he says, wow. That mystical moment is walking now on two feet on this earth. I'm in. I'm in. I hope you have those moments too. I hope you have those moments too and that you're in. 
Third, and this is my favorite for this week, given all that's been going on in the wider world in politics and in the pandemic crisis, my worry about friends who don't have work, who are feeling the isolation, you know, starts with Solomon. And then we hear from Jeremiah, Micah, Hosea, Joel, Habakkuk, Zechariah. They all use this image of contentment, of peace, as sitting under your fig tree. One of the things they promise for when God sets things right, for when the Messiah comes, is that we'll all be able to sit under our own fig tree. It's an interesting image, isn't it? Hard to figure out what a comparison for it would be right now for us. You know, we'll all sit under our own maple tree and the syrup will run 12 months of the year. I mean, who knows, though, what an equivalent would be for us to, to today. We'll all have our own personal Tim's in the house and we can just go out and there'll be a very friendly and helpful uh, server there to give us a good cup of Tim's coffee, you know, or McDonald's coffee or Java Moose or Piccadilly, whatever what your favorite coffee is. Like, uh, who knows? But the image, of course, is contentment and rest. And all the prophets use the image of sitting under the fig tree as that. But I wonder if Nathaniel was so aware of how that was only a promise and there was very little evidence of it. There was the poverty, there was the near slavery of being but a day laborer in Jesus' day under the oppression of the Romans and their taxes and their soldiers. There was the cynicism and skepticism about even the leadership of the Jewish people, self-serving, collaborating with the Romans, you know. Uh, even the Pharisees are so well regarded for a skeptical or a critical person, you know. You had to be upper middle class to keep all 617 laws of the Old Testament, you know. You, you couldn't do it. When you were living a hand-to-mouth existence as a day laborer, the poverty, the long hours, the illness and the sickness that was going on. Maybe Nathaniel had even heard of Jesus' healings or something. He was certainly going to discover that. And maybe Nathaniel was very aware of the difference between the hope and the longing for peace and fulfillment and day-to-day -day reality. Maybe that's what he was going through under that fig tree. Oh, here I am under a fig tree. Sure doesn't feel like what the prophet said. Oh God, you know, I'm, I'm doubting your, your, your promises. I'm doubting your love for our people. I'm, I'm even doubting the leaders that supposedly set themselves up as, uh, you know, your teachers and your inspirers for me. Some people just seem to be born eh, with a uh, critical um, view of things, maybe because of the tragedies they had in their early years, or it may be. Some people are, are just like that. They're natural cynics. Does that mean they cannot be believers? Maybe that's what Jesus meant when he said, here's an Israelite in which there is no deceit. And this guy sees things for the way they are. But if he's loved by the right person. If I can be a vehicle of God's love for him, he can stop being part of the problem and start being part of the solution in his own way. When we're frustrated, eh? in the New Testament, this is described as a spirit groaning in us, or even the spirit grieving in us, this restlessness, this dissatisfaction, this longing. And maybe that's what 
Nathaniel felt sitting under that fig tree. I don't know. This just doesn't feel like a fig tree experience to me right now. I feel like what the prophets promised. So are you feeling frustrated? Are you feeling disillusioned? Well, those feelings are of God. God has promised an answer. It seems unrealistic. There's a prayer I say every day that was prayed by Anne MacDonald of Macabre back in the 19th century. And it, um, it goes, I find my, bank, my mind's gone blank. Help me to think on the death of Christ Help me to meditate upon the agony of Christ. Help me to make warm the love of Christ. And so we can see in our times of suffering and hardship and disappointment, we can remember what Jesus went through. What Jesus is going through by his spirit in us, we can find comfort, find comfort in our discouragement. We can remember the fig tree promise that, and it's beginning to be fulfilled as it was for Nathaniel here in Jesus coming to us, dying, suffering with us, and rising again from the dead to show what the end of the story is, the victory we know. So whether we're having a moment of shame, we want to cover ourselves with fig leaves. That's a good sign in a way. But whether we're having a mystical moment, God is so good and so real, and I'm privileged to enjoy it under our fig tree, enjoy the sweetness of a good fruit. Or whether we're just aware of a contrast between the way things are meant to be, the way things we want them to be, and the way things are. Maybe hear Jesus saying, come with me. You'll see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, ascending and descending in your own life. Thanks be to God. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Page 52, the Book of Alternative Services, or Affirmation of Faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Page 117 of our Book of Alternative Services. Uh, let me number nine for our morning prayers. I just documented many prayers for the beginning of our new week in God's love. Let us ask the Lord for a week of fulfillment and peace. And our responsibilities at work or in our family life, around the farm, or the shed, or the basement, at the kitchen sink, wherever where it may be, in our relationships with family members, with friends, even those we can only talk to through the internet or by the telephone. May we know peace. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to teach us to love others as he has loved us. Lord, in our delights and in our despair, in our fulfillments and in our frustrations, may your spirit be teaching us strength, patience, appreciation, Empathy, may your spirit call us to stand with Jesus and in his strength to love those around us. What this world needs, Lord, is love. There are people now who are lonesome, who need us to call them. There are people now who are feeling without hope, who need a little bit of an extra hand. There are people who are receiving ministries from the missions and the outreach project of your people in churches and para-Christian organizations in just community organizations that nonetheless have so many Christians keeping them going and inspiring them. And uh, may we do our part in giving, in sharing, in praying, and that you teach us that our love for others may be ever more helpful for them as you have loved us. Lord, have mercy. So let us ask the Lord for peace and justice in the world. Oh Lord, we pray for our neighbors and friends and the best allies anyone in the world could ever have, our American friends, in the trials of their own nation, its divisions, its disappointments, the anger and the fear we pray for the new administration that will be coming into place. And for those who were so loyal for whatever reason to the old administration and will still have a hand in governing, bless the people of the United States that it may be a city on a hill, as Ronald Reagan said, that it may be a light once again to the free world. And bless the people who are struggling under oppression in places like Russia, or China, or the Middle East. Bless the peoples of Latin America, bless the peoples of Africa, bless all those who are suffering with disease, especially this horrible COVID disease, including in our own country, and be with our leaders. Thank you for our queen and her leadership, her inspiration, be with the royal family, that they may all reflect her dedication to service, to goodness, to the public good be with our Prime Minister and his cabinet, with every member of Parliament, including those who represent our county. Be with our Premier, be with school teachers, be with nurses and medical people, be with first responders, be with our police officers, be with those who are working in restaurants, providing us all a bit of a relief, a bit of relaxation, a bit of a moment under a fig tree at their own risk. 
O Lord, may there be peace and justice in the world. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to strengthen and relieve those who are in need. We pray for Bishop David's mother and father in England. His mother in a nursing home. His father um, also experiencing the challenges of senior years. We pray for Russell Matthews. Pray for Eileen Saunders. Pray for those in their own circles of love and care, that you will bless them and keep them, and give them wholeness and health. We pray for all the victims of COVID. Pray for the others whose surgeries or treatments are being delayed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. O oh Lord, strengthen and relieve all those who are in need. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to renew the church through the power of his life-giving spirit. Lord, may your Holy Spirit be with our bishop, our archdeacon, Rob Marsh, our regional dean, David Turner, our missional priest, Dan McMullen. Be with all the wardens, all the volunteers in ACW and Guilds of St. Joseph and other organizations. Be with all pastors and teachers and Christians, Christian volunteers in the church and without. May the church gathered in named communities, but also scattered into the world all week long in people loving and serving and standing up for what's true. May we be renewed to face these post-church going days with authenticity of faith, the power of witness to your goodness, with a societal changing love and dedication. We can't do that on our own. This is not a human movement. Renew the church through the power of your life-giving spirit. Lord, have mercy. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. Guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may never forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. That little uh, intercessions number nine in the book of Alternative Sources, page 117, it's very short, but it's, it's, it's covers everything and I commend it. I memorized it for my daily prayers my, myself because um, those, those five intercessions really cover everything. But as you know, I always think we should end our prayers on a note of thanksgiving. But I also commend the beautiful thanksgiving on page 129 and following of the Book of Alternative Services. Well, it comes to us from the uh, prayer book of the Episcopal Church in the United States of America, uh, 1979, it's there. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ for the truth of his word, and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit, that we may know Christ 
and make him known. And through him at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. The prayers of Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest, lay down. Thy head, O weary one, thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was so weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of his life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and grant us peace. Amen.